Welcome to or welcome back to Wrong Sports as I now go back to my old series of how the year was won. And in this series, I'd like to take you back to a year in college football when something big happened, like the first AP poll, which you can see in my episode in 1936, or a year where no one knew who was going to be the national champion in my two-part series on the 1990 college football season. But in this episode, I'm going to take you back all the way back 100 years, almost 100 years, the year that I'll be covering is 1924, which was a year in college football with not just one, but a few of some of the biggest legends in college football history. And this was also a year in college football where one of college football's most famous teams finally got to the top of the peak. But before I get to the year of 1924, make sure as always you go down below and subscribe to the channel. And of course, ring the bell so you can get updates on brand new videos that I will be dropping in the future. Of course, like and share this video and share this channel with other college football fans so I can get above 1,000 subscribers. And of course, make sure you check out my Patreon so you can help out the channel. You can check out my podcast and my social media all in the description below. Okay, so first off, since this channel is a college sports and college football history channel, then you might know that I like to give some context or description on the year that I'll be covering. I do that because there are a lot of games and teams to cover in a year of college football, so I like to pick teams that are atop of the AP poll or might have a great team that season. But since the year that I'll be covering in this episode doesn't have an AP ranking, I'll be making my own ranking and use that as my narrative throughout the video. Yeah, this kind of scares me too because maybe making rankings for college football games that happened 100 years ago and games that I was not watching. I have seen some of them uh, via videos that I've seen online, but haven't really watched a lot of these. I'm just using a lot of stats to make up these polls. I'm also using the Dickinson poll, which was a poll that was put out in 1926 and did retroactive polls. But that is what I'll be using, and I'll use that to go over the best players, the biggest and most important teams and games throughout the season. But to start, I'm going to start with my very own ranking. I have an actual ranked top 10 and then I'll be doing 10 more teams that are just outside of the top 10, but I'll put them in my top 20 and I'm going to put them in no particular order after that. Number one, the Cal Bears. This team is absolutely unstoppable. They have been 36-0-2 since the start of the 1920s. They went to two Rose Bowls, and countless writers were naming their wonder teams the best they have ever seen. But even though they were unbeatable, they are showing signs of eventual defeat, as their offense did score a lot less in 1923 than they did during the 1920-1922 through 1922 seasons. Their line was their best feature, as they had Edwin Horrell leading it. But I mostly put them at the top of my ranking this year because they were unbeaten for the the last four seasons and they have some great players back so many would expect them to go unbeaten again. Coming in at number two is the University of Illinois as they went 8-0 in 1923 and going into 1924 there were a lot of great players talked about but the one that I'll be starting with was looking to become a repeat All-American and to help his team win the Big Ten outright title this year. Harold Redgrange was the player that would take over college football this year. He was mostly unknown going into 1923 but wasn't unknown coming into this season because they went 8-0 last year under their head coach Ray Zupke and sports writers are naming them the best team coming into the 1924 season. Coming in at number three, I'm going East to Yale, who were also 8-0 in 1923, and Eastern teams were given more praise and attention, but Yale was the best coming into the 1924 season, in my opinion. They were bringing back a great line along with a future Yale coach in Ducky Pond running the ball. They beat Army, Princeton, Harvard, and Georgia last year. They also had five shutouts, and they still had their coach and future Hall of Famer Tad Jones with them too. Coming in at number four is Cornell, who were 24-0 from 1921 to 1923. They were still coached by the legendary Gil Doby. I went over this awesome streak in my Gil Doby deep dive, which you can see above. But they lost a lot of great players coming into the 1924 season, like the leading scorer from last season in their quarterback, George Fan. Even though they lost him, I can't rank them any lower than this due to their dominance over the last three years, as they won 24 games in a row by an average of 35 points or more, and they would still have a fantastic line. Rounding out the top five would be Notre Dame. They were 9-1 in 1923, but they would be bringing back their amazing backfield, starring their quarterback, Harry Stooldridge, 
halfback Jim Crowley, halfback Don Miller, and also back Elmer Layden, who were put together in 1922, made quite the scene in 1923, but would hit their stride in this season because they would all be coming in as seniors. Oh, and they also had coaching legend Newt Rockney, who already coached Notre Dame from 1919 on to a 48-4-3 record. Number six would be Michigan. They were 8-0 last year with their longtime head coach Fielding H. Yost and All-American Harry Kipke. The team was undefeated last year because they didn't face Illinois, who was in their conference. But they did beat Vanderbilt, plus they beat Big Ten teams Ohio State, Iowa, and they also had five shutouts. But this year, Kipke and Yost would not be there. Kipke graduated and Yost would be taking a year off after 20 plus years on the sideline and made his top assistant George Little to be the coach. Yost was the athletic director so he was able to do coaching changes but I'm sure he was still involved with the team as he is in the picture with the team at the beginning of the season. But even with those losses, they still did have a talented team like Todd Rockwell, who is at quarterback, as well as future star and college football Hall of Famer Benny Friedman playing backup. Because they lost Kipke and Yost wouldn't be fully involved, I had to rank them a little lower than Notre Dame. Number seven is Army. They were 6-2-1 last year, but they were Army, who before World War II could get any athlete they wanted and play them immediately. Example this year was Harry Wilson, who was a fantastic running back that played at Penn State in 1923 and was named an All-American, but because he graduated and would go to West Point, he got to play immediately. To go along with that, they still had a powerful line, still thought of as a top team no matter their record, and rarely if ever traveled outside of New York. Number eight is another Big Ten team in Chicago, who were 18-3-1 from 1921 to 1923. They won the Big Ten in 1922 and lost 7 to nothing in 1923 to Illinois. Besides winning seven games, they also only gave up 15 points all season. They had four shutouts, and I mention this because their line, which made up the biggest reason for holding so many teams to such low scores, was all coming back. Their best player was Joe Pondalek and Frank Gaudi, who would both both be All-American selections in 1923. And of course, they were also coached by the legend, who is now in his 33rd season at Chicago in Amos Alonzo Stagg. Number nine is Washington, who were 10-1-1 in 1923. They went to the Rose Bowl where they tied Navy, but the team would be bringing back a high-scoring team led by their best player in back Wildcat Wilson, who scored 37 total touchdowns over his three years at the school, but their only loss in 1923 was a 9 to nothing loss to Cal. And rounding out the top 10 is another Eastern school in Dartmouth. They were led by Jesse Hawley. They went 8-1 in 1923, only losing to Cornell, but they had five shutouts and scored over 20 points per game. Their schedule really doesn't blow you away, but they showed that they are a talented team that got better after the Cornell loss and will bring back a lot of talented players in their backfield, which is a reason I believe they are a top 10 team. And you can see the whole top 10 right here. And you can also see the teams that are in the top 20 to me, but are not top 10 teams. And this is in no particular order. So now that you know the top teams, players, and coaches, let's start the season. The first game that had a lot of rankings consequences would happen on October 3rd as Missouri would travel to Chicago to play Stag's Chicago squad. I'm going to talk just very little about Missouri, who are in the Missouri Valley Conference at this point. They weren't terrible through the early 1920s. They did have two winning records over the last three years, but they could never get over the hump and actually win the conference. They could never beat Nebraska for it, who had won it the last three years. Along with that, they were also trying to get more press like Nebraska had done. So they were trying to play some bigger teams, and Chicago was the first team to step up and play them in 1924. Missouri would take the opportunity of playing a big-time team and stop Chicago from getting any closer than their 30-yard line, shutting them out and winning three to nothing. And while that upset was going on, Nebraska would host Illinois and Red Grange to town. The previous year, Red Grange had run all over them for three touchdowns, but this year, Nebraska was ready for him and stopped him from scoring. Unfortunately, Nebraska couldn't get any more than six points and would lose to Illinois nine to six. 
But let's go to the next week of October 11th, which wasn't as exciting as the previous week, but did have one big game of note, as Georgia would travel to the North to play Yale and try to get the South's big win. These North-South games were starting to become regular occasions, as Southern teams were starting to be more competitive and also starting to beat Northern teams. Yale had pretty much had no trouble with Southern teams, including destroying Georgia in 1923, 40-0. Georgia would finish that year 5-3-1, and one, and were starting to show that they were a top Southern team on par with Vanderbilt, which I know seems kind of crazy to hear. In the game, Georgia would show off their passing attack, completing a 75-yard touchdown pass in the first quarter, but unfortunately missed the extra point. That would come back to haunt them as the Yale offense would finally score in the third quarter and kick the extra point and hold on to win 7-6. It was unfortunate since Georgia had the lead for a lot of the game, plus they also led in yardage through the entire game as well. Going now into the weekend of October 18th, as we would have two games which would make nationwide stars. The first one was the biggest one to me and to my rankings, as it happened in the Midwest, as Michigan would finally travel to Illinois to get their first look at Red Grange. Again, remember, Michigan had not played Illinois last year, which probably would have named not only a conference champion, but a national champion. So this game was a game getting nationwide attention in the newspapers and in radio. And with over 66,000 people in attendance, they saw what the New York Times called the greatest performance on the gridiron, as Red Grange would return the opening kickoff for a 95-yard touchdown, and then tack on three more touchdowns in the first quarter to give them a 27-0 lead. Michigan would never get any closer than that, pretty much, and Illinois would win 39-14. Grange had five touchdowns in this game and gained 402 yards of total offense, which is insane. While sports writers fawned over Red Grange, famous sports writer Grantland Rice was at the Polo Grounds in New York City to see Army vs. Notre Dame. Notre Dame had started the season 2-0 over smaller Indiana schools and won them both by shutouts, while Army was also 2-0, both by shutouts as well, but over bigger, more well-known teams like St. Louis and the University of Detroit. But this game would be a lot different, as there would be points on both sides, but it was Notre Dame and their backfield, which was able to score twice and win 13-7. This win would propel Notre Dame to even greater heights, as Grantlin Rice would write a famous article about the backfield backfield, which he would coin as the four horsemen backfield of Notre Dame. And due to the article that Rice wrote, this would push the school to take the famous picture of the four horsemen backfield on horseback, which appeared in newspapers all over the country, further promoting Notre Dame nationwide. One more game of note happening in October, especially to my rankings, was Yale versus Dartmouth. Yale was 2-0, but wins over Georgia and UNC, while Dartmouth was 3-0, all by shutouts, but over much smaller Northeastern schools. Because of Dartmouth's perceived easier schedule, Yale was favored in the game, but Dartmouth would take it to Yale, putting up 324 yards of rushing to Yale's 225. Unfortunately, though, it wasn't enough for them to eke out the win, as Yale and Dartmouth would tie 14-14, and this final was very significant to the end of the year. After that busy week, there was really only one more kind of important game as Chicago played to another 3-3 tie to Ohio State. But other than that, no other top teams in my poll had trouble this weekend. So now we are going into November, and I'm going to show you my poll going into November. I'm not really going to give you a recap because I kind of gave you a little recap of what was happening with everyone. But I am going to mention one team of note, that being Iowa. They are new to my poll at number five, and they shot them beating Minnesota and them also being 3-0-1. Their only detriment there being that tie versus Ohio State. And Ohio State at this point were 2-0-2, so I had to rank Iowa higher than them. And now we are in November and this is where the season really heats up and I'm going to be doing a couple of polls in this month. The first weekend of November had a big matchup out west as USC traveled to Berkeley to play Cal. USC had not beaten Cal the last three times they played, but the games were all low scoring and close. This one would be no different, and it looked like for a while they would come out with a scoreless tie, but Cal would be able to get in the end zone late, which was all Cal would need to win 7 to nothing, ruining USC's perfect season. Yale and Army would also battle in the Yale Bowl in front of 80,000 fans. 
And the game looked like it was going to be a runaway game for Army as they racked up 200 yards rushing to Yale's 100. And Yale would score first on a 40-yard touchdown run by Ducky Pond. Army would continue their running game and eventually score in the fourth quarter to tie it up, and no one else would be able to, so the game would end in a tie, giving Yale their second tie of the season. The weekend of November 8th would have one big game, and it happened in the Big Ten again between Chicago and Illinois. Having knowledge of Grange only only made Chicago tougher as they were coached by Stagg, who made his whole game plan around containing Grange. Grange still managed to run rampant and help Illinois score 21 points. This was the most amount of points Chicago had given up in over three years. Fortunately for the defense, the offense managed to score three times too, so Chicago and Illinois tied at 21. This gave Illinois their first non-win in over a year and a half, and this game would slightly affect my rankings too. I say slightly would affect my rankings because there was another top 10 team that tied this week too as Washington battled Cal to a 7-7 tie. And this was the closest Washington had gotten to beating Cal over the last five years as Cal would routinely demolish Washington. In addition, this weekend would also have a few teams climb into my top 10. The first one was Stanford. I didn't really cover this team too much. They still had the legend Pop Warner coaching them and Stanford would score some big wins over over Oregon and Idaho in September and really hit their stride in October with two shutout wins at the end of the month and also continue that with a 30 to nothing win over Utah on November 8th, a game in which Nevers would play. He didn't play a lot this season and I'll go over that, like I said, towards the end of the season. But let's speak about teams with great defenses. One team that would climb into my top 10 was Alabama, who would cruise through September not giving up a single point in five straight games. Then to start November, they would score two more wins over Ole Miss and Kentucky, with only Kentucky scoring, but Alabama averaged 50 points in these wins, so it didn't really matter. Alabama would do all of this on the coaching of future legend Wallace Wade, who at this point was only a top assistant at Vanderbilt, but came to Alabama in 1923 to Turn around the program, and he would do that quickly, being 7 2 1 in his first year of 1923. And he had a great line with a great all around player in Pooley Hubert, who started as a tackle in 1923, only to be let loose as a back soon after that, which helped Alabama to be 7 0 with six shutouts and scoring over 30 points per game. But now I'm going to quickly go into a poll I have going into the games on November 15th. Notre Dame is still number one. You see Illinois at two, Cal at three, Penn is four, five will be Dartmouth. Don't worry, though, they won't stay there because their schedule is not the greatest. Stanford is at six. Number seven is Yale. They are down here because of the two ties. And again, that won't stick. So don't worry. Number eight is Alabama. Nine is Michigan and 10 is West Virginia. And there is the rest of the top 20 as I get into the weekend of November 15th, which would see some top teams end their season. First off, top five team Dartmouth. Like I said, they jumped Yale due to having one tie to Yale's two, but they would end their season versus Cornell. And you haven't heard me talk about Cornell a lot, even though they started as a top five team. That was because they had two pretty bad October losses. They lost to Williams College, which is a huge upset. They would also lose again. They were coming into this game four and three, and Dartmouth made up the previous three years of losing to Cornell by soundly beating Cornell 27 to 14 to end their season 7-0 and 1. Meanwhile, Yale was ending their season versus Princeton and ended their year with a 10 to nothing win to be 6-0 and 2 on the year, and you will see them in the next poll and they're going to be moving around a little bit. And here's an Eastern team that shot up my rankings, and that is Penn, the Penn Quakers. I haven't talked about them a lot because they were coming into the season five and three, but they were one of the most well-known teams. This was due to their history going all the way back to the 1870s. They also had a ton of famous players and great teams, and Penn was also a little different from other Northeastern teams, like the ones that I've mentioned in my poll a lot, like Yale and Dartmouth and Harvard. That was because Penn didn't really play Yale or Dartmouth or even even Harvard and Princeton. Penn wanted to play in Philadelphia, they would rarely travel, and they would play pretty much teams from all over the place, which was not something the other schools, like I mentioned, did. 
Because of not playing those Eastern teams, Penn would fill their schedule with lower-level Eastern teams like Franklin and Marshall, Drexel, Swarthmore, and they would also play teams from the South like Virginia and Georgetown. And with that schedule, Penn at this point were 8-0. They had shutouts galore with six of them. They were only giving up 17 points all season, but they were really only three good wins out of those eight, and I use that lightly, as they beat Virginia, who ended their season with a winning record. They shut out Columbia which is a pretty good win. They also skated by Lafayette the previous week. The Lafayette win was actually a good win because Lafayette were 5-0 and coming into the game when they played Penn and lose to them. Due to the 8-0 record though and the better schedule, I have to put Penn in my rankings. They were a team that everyone would talk about. You would see them all over newspapers. It's not hard to find articles about the Penn Quakers football team, so I gotta put them in my rankings. Also, you'll be hearing about them at the end of the season too. Penn though would be getting some better teams to pass their schedule at the end of the season. They would have Penn State come to town this weekend, and Penn State were coming in 5-2 and two after beating Navy two weeks before. So if Penn could beat their in-state rival Penn State, that would be considered a pretty good win. Unfortunately, the game on November 15th was a messy affair, as hail and rain fell before and during the game, causing a muddy field. This stopped either team from doing pretty much anything, and Penn's best play was a 50-yard run, but neither team could score, and it would end in a scoreless tie. But I'm going to be leaving the East for a moment because there were two big upsets happening this weekend too. Illinois was still unbeaten at this point behind Red Grange, but could no longer be my top team after a tie to Chicago the previous week. This week though, Illinois would travel to Minnesota. Minnesota were one of my top 20 teams to start the year, but after two losses and two ties and two wins, they had a very strange 2-2-2 two, two, and two record. Plus, they had no wins in the Big Ten Conference at this point. This game would be a complete disaster for Illinois, as they could get nothing going against the Minnesota defense until late, but by that point, they were down by two scores. Grange couldn't even get any points, and this was the first time in his college career that Red Grange and Illinois would lose 20 to seven. The game was shocking for everyone, but after the high-scoring tie the previous week, Illinois was showing some signs of eventual defeat. It was just very strange that it was to Minnesota, but with that top five team losing, there was going to be a big drop and give a top ten team a shot at that top five, and the best case was for Alabama. I mentioned Alabama's dominance over the last few weeks, and they would welcome Tiny Center College to play them this week. Center College was in my top 20 teams at the beginning of the year, mostly because they had shown from the start of the 1920s that they were a really good team, no matter the size. They had beat Harvard in 1921 in one of college football's biggest upsets ever, and they were 7-1-1 in 1923, including beating four Southern Conference teams, which was the same conference that Alabama was in. I mention that because Center wasn't in the SoCon at this point. They were a small school, and they weren't getting any bigger, unlike schools in the SoCon. So Center College would play in the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Association, which had a bunch of smaller schools, most of which are in D3 because this conference is a D3 conference, or they don't play anymore. But just because they were so small, they still had a very good player in their quarterback, Herb Covington. He actually played in that famous upset of Harvard, mostly as a backup, but he would break many records in 1922 and 23 with his running abilities. And as a senior in 1924, he was looking to lead center again. And Center College would start the season 1-0-1, not giving up any points. But then they would travel to the Polo Grounds in New York City to play of all teams West Virginia. Yeah, kind of a strange uh, mix of teams there to play in New York City. But anyway, since none of these teams were that well known and not that well known in New York City either, only 1,000 people would show up to see West Virginia score a big 13-6 win. The win would propel West Virginia up my rankings, but it also made Center mad as they would win their next two games on the road by shutout over Kentucky and Tennessee, and Center would have to play on the road again versus Alabama, and the game would start slow, with the first points coming just before halftime, as Center College's Herb Covington scored to make it 7 to nothing. 
Alabama's defense had only given up one touchdown all season and would give up not only one in the first half, but again in the second half too. Meanwhile, Alabama's offense couldn't get anything going, and Center College would shock and shut out the mighty Alabama team, 17 to nothing. This was the worst loss Alabama and Wallace Wade had had, and it would push Alabama to be an unstoppable team over the next couple of seasons. The weekend of or before Thanksgiving is usually when a lot of rivalry games would happen, and along with that, the November 22nd weekend would also be when conferences would be decided, and the PCC Championship game was basically happening this week, as the two unbeaten squads out west would play in Berkeley as Stanford would play the Mighty Cal Bears. Stanford were 7-0. Most of their wins came without their best player, Ernie Nevers. I mentioned how they had a big win over Utah. He played in that game, but he also had suffered two broken ankles and would suffer through that throughout most of the season. Like I mentioned, he played in that Utah game two weeks before this, but he wouldn't be playing in this game. And this was going to be the 30th big game. And Stanford was looking for their first win over Cal since 1914, which was when both of these schools were playing rugby. Stanford also were heavy underdogs, and it looked like Cal would win again, as they had a 20-6 lead late. But then in the fourth quarter, Stanford scored quick, and then went on a 70-yard drive to score again, and tie it at 20 to stun the almost 100,000 people in attendance. The tie would put Cal at 2-0-2 in the PCC, while Stanford were 3-0-1, giving them the conference title and the Rose Bowl berth on New Year's Day. But don't worry about Cal because they would also be playing on New Year's Day. There would be some more conference championship games sort of happening as the Big Ten would have three deciding games happening at the same time. Chicago was leading the Big Ten at this point as they had gone unbeaten at a 3-0-2 record. Behind them was Illinois, which had the tie versus Chicago, but after losing to Minnesota the previous week, they were 2-1-1. One, and, one. and finally, Michigan was just behind them at 4-1, and one. but since they lost to Illinois, they needed Illinois to lose again, and Michigan would be playing Iowa, who were also in the mix with a 2-1-1 one, and one record. Well, in a weird ending and record for a team, Chicago would end up getting a scoreless tie this time to Wisconsin to end with a 3-0-3 and three record in the conference. Meanwhile, Illinois would end up shutting out Ohio State, ending up in second place. And in the big game between Iowa and Michigan, Michigan were coming in very good at 6-1. and one. That was because after their crushing loss to Illinois about a month ago, they would insert a new quarterback in Benny Friedman. He would win the next three games for Michigan, so Michigan would have a chance at winning the conference. Unfortunately, in this game versus Iowa, the Iowa defense wouldn't let Benny Friedman do anything, and Michigan Michigan would lose to Iowa 9-2. But one more thing of note before the final poll, and that was that Georgia, who is now 7-1, would be playing Alabama and Center College over a three-day span on the road. Not sure why they did this. A lot of teams in the SoCon, like I mentioned, didn't consider teams that were like Center College on their level. So maybe that's why they were okay with playing them three days apart. But anyway, the game versus Alabama was first, and this game wasn't much of a game as it resulted in who would be the Southern Conference champion, and Georgia would lose it pretty badly, 33 to nothing, so now Bama was considered the best team in the South. Two days later, Georgia would travel to Kentucky to play Center College, and this game was a little closer, but Georgia would still lose 14 to 7. Georgia would end their season 7 and 3. Alabama were 8 and 1, but undefeated in the SoCon, so they were the Southern Conference champions, while Center College were 5-1 one, and 1, but had 5 wins over Southern teams, including including Alabama and Georgia, so a lot of sports writers mention them as the champions of the South. But here you go, here is the final regular season poll. I'm not gonna go in depth on this poll because I'm gonna be having another poll that will be coming out after the few bowl games that we have coming up. Yes, there is more than one bowl game that is gonna be happening in 1924, which was a rarity before World War II as there would be the Los Angeles Christmas Festival game between USC and Missouri. This would have the look of a bowl game, though. In the game, Missouri's offense couldn't do much except for a fourth-quarter touchdown, and USC would get three touchdowns in the third quarter to win 20-7 and end their season 9-2. That will move them up in my rankings. Missouri would end their season 7-2, so obviously they will move down in my rankings.
The next bowl games, yes, bowl games, would happen on New Year's Day. There would actually be three of them happening on this day. The first one would be happening down in Dallas, and it was the Dixie Classic between West Virginia Wesleyan and SMU. SMU was unbeaten at 5-0-4 and and had been unbeaten for 19 games coming in. I didn't rank this team in my top 10 because they had so many ties, including three straight to end the season, and the ties would hurt them from winning the conference too that they were in. West Virginia Wesleyan, meanwhile, had never gone to a bowl game, and this would be their only one, and they had made the best of it as they came back to win this game 9-7 to Ending their season 9-2, and two, this team does have some pretty good wins, like this one and also beating Pitt. So that is why you see West Virginia ranked so high, because West Virginia beat West Virginia Wesleyan. Next up would be the Rose Bowl, which would happen just a few hours after that game in Dallas, and it would be a great one between number 7 in my ranking, Stanford, and the number 1 overall team in my mind in Notre Dame. And there would be three Irish touchdowns that were scored on Stanford turnovers, and Stanford had eight turnovers in this game alone. Elmer Layden would score three touchdowns for Notre Dame, one of which was a three-yard run in the second quarter, to give Notre Dame a 6-3 lead, and they would never lose that lead from then on. They would also get two more interception returns late in the game to seal it for Notre Dame. Meanwhile, Ernie Nevers would have a legend that would grow just slightly because of this game. He would play all 60 minutes in this game. He also rushed for 114 yards, which was more yardage than all of the four horsemen. But unfortunately, all of those yards and everything that he could do on two semi-broken ankles at this point wouldn't be enough because Notre Dame and the four horsemen would cement their great season, winning 27-10. And one more final Final game because this would also be happening on New Year's Day in California as Penn would travel across the country to play the Cal Bears. This was a rare journey for Penn, which hardly if ever had road games like I mentioned, and if you use my poll, this would be another game between two top five teams. But this wasn't really a bowl game as it was called an intersectional game, but it was also a game that came about because after Stanford was placed into the Rose Bowl, Cal was still unbeaten and they didn't really have anything to do and they wanted to schedule another game versus an Eastern team on New Year's Day and Penn was named the best team of the Atlantic or the East and they were perhaps the best Eastern team at this point. So they would take the invite from Cal and they would go to play them on New Year's Day. I haven't been able to find clear proof as to why this game was scheduled besides Cal looking for another game and they saw that Stanford was going to the Rose Bowl so they said hey Penn would you like to play us and Penn accepted the invite and would take the long journey over there. The game would be held in Berkeley in front of 60,000 fans and it would start slow as both defenses were very good but Cal would finally score and seal it with a last minute touchdown to win 14 to nothing. Okay, so there you go. There are all the games that I can go over for the 1924 season, and here is my final poll. Obviously, at number one is not going to change. Notre Dame has to be there. The Stanford win just cemented Notre Dame as being the best team this year. I would have loved to see them play Cal in the Rose Bowl instead, but oh well. Number two is going to be Cal. That Penn win was probably their best win of the season, but they also beat USC and St. Mary's, which are both top 20 teams. Yale is going to be number three for me, and again, their schedule is the main reason why they're higher than Dartmouth, even though they tied each other. I would have liked to have seen Yale play Penn. And that would have made a, a better way of finding who was the better team of the East. Coming in at number four, you see Illinois right there. I have them higher than Dartmouth because of their schedule and because they won their games in dominating fashion. USC will round out my top five. They boosted up the poll because they beat Syracuse on December 6th. That was a game I didn't talk about because it came out after my final poll. Plus, they also beat Missouri. And they have a lot better wins than the rest of the top ten here. You see West Virginia at number six. They do have that really good win over West Virginia Wesleyan, which looks even better now since West Virginia Wesleyan won their bowl game. Dartmouth is number seven. I really can't put them any lower than that just because they are unbeaten. Yes, I would have loved to have seen their schedule be a little bit better or for them to have played Penn, maybe. Their best team was Cornell, who was four and four. So really, not the best schedule. Iowa number eight. This team is going to move up in the poll because they didn't play a bowl game, so they move up one spot. Again, their schedule is a lot better uh, than Stanford and Penn, who you see at 9 and 10 and Penn zoomed up my poll around Thanksgiving but now since they lost to Cal they moved back down. I couldn't put them out of the top 10 because 
on their schedule. They dominated. They have all those shutouts. And they have a slightly better schedule than Stanford, who's at number 10. Stanford, who were unbeaten the whole season without their best player, but they don't really have any good wins. Like, their best win is Oregon, which really isn't that good of a win that season. Their two best games were versus Cal and Notre Dame, which resulted in a tie and a loss. And the rest of the top 25, some of the teams you see there, you see Michigan, I can't put them any lower than in my top 25. St. Mary's of California staying in my top 25. West Virginia Wesleyan. Army's in there. Washington and Jefferson is a team that uh, I haven't talked about, but I'm going to be talking about in a future episode of how the year was won. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Also Lafayette, another team I'll be talking about in the future, and SMU there as well. But I hope you liked this episode of how the year was won, 1924. Tell me what you think. Tell me who you think should have been named the national champion of the 1924 season. Uh, Some of these videos are from the 1924 season. Some of them are from earlier. I want to thank College Football Historian on YouTube. Got to give him a shout out because he has all these videos here. Uh, You can check out really old college football footage. That's how I got it uh, for this video. So I want to thank him a lot. And coming up in the future, going to have a video of how the year was won 1926 and 1927. I'm really happy about doing those, so be on the lookout for those coming up in the future. And you can check out the rest of my How the Year Was One series in the playlist to the side. And also down below, I've got some links uh, to my How the Year Was One series. Also, as always, make sure you subscribe to the channel below. Ring the bell so you can get updates on when those new How the Year Was One videos are going to be coming out. Like and share this video with other college football fans, and have a fantastic rest of your day, guys.